Admit, I know very, very little about this. This was my introduction to this, and I did want to ask um, Bernard, um, but kind of didn't negotiate um, the, the stuff fast enough. I had to ask questions, but um, I did wonder about the high BMI in the schizophrenia patients. Maybe Jay will talk about this um, as being a, an indicator for sort of poorer outcomes and admissions that Bernard was talking about. Um, whether there was microbiota in this mix, um, where, whether the olanzapine somehow does something with that, or is it an immune thing as well? I don't know, but because of my interest sparked from this conference. I just did wonder, wonder about this. Um, so what they've also noticed in this is, uh, in these studies is now showing different mi microbiota in women um, who are depressed and anti um, de specifically antenatally is what they're, they're looking at. Um, but those also with histories of anxiety and depression and looking at the diversity of the microbiota and what this means. Um, and they know that uh, they are affected by health, nutrition, stress and genes. And I know someone in the, the, the uh, audience asked, well, can you go and get your Yakult um, and will that fix everything? It's not that simple. Um, it, uh, but the idea and certainly the suggestion was that um, and I'm not sure if Survey are doing this, but that maybe one of the directions um, in the future is actually um, you know, having a year cult, especially for your disorder kind of thing. Um, so that's sort of where the, the, the work is going um, with that. Um, the mother-infant infant relationship, though, is still hugely important in this, and I, in the, ma the last 10 years, or well, last 20 years, really, have become much more interested in attachment because it was something I could change here and now in the patients I was seeing. Um, and uh, there's fortunately a lot of great research been done in that. The research does show, though, that the antenatal influences are probably more um, uh, stronger, if you like, um, certainly make it with, associated with significant um, outcomes than the postnatal ones alone. But if you have the antenatal sort of anxiety and depression and the postnatal anxiety and depression in your mother, then that you're, you're, that's the worst sort of possible um, that you can come up with. Now, the biological underpinning for this, um, now I know she's in the audience, um, so go talk to her about this because it was fascinating. Catherine Maud was presenting on this um, in India and she's involved with the seed, which I really didn't know much about, though I know Jen McIntosh, um, who does, a, I think, think has this huge research grant um, looking at some of the early um, development uh, and attachment um, focus. But I don't think really there had been, or I hadn't seen anything looking heavily at the biological um, kind of what is going on biologically with this group. With the, um, I had seen sort of studies that had looked at the oxytocin um, gene in trauma victims and that, um, that the oxytocin didn't seem to be as high in the, in mothers um, when they were doing that bonding, and that does seem to be sort of what the marker of falling in love with your baby. And trauma victims seem to have lower levels of that, so I'm sort of aware of that. Um, but Catherine's looking at demethylisation of genes. I think I've got this right. Um, of demethylisation of the D, which is the turning off of. It's not always um, the case, but usually demethylisation um, sort of in this epigenetic kind of period um, after birth, what happens and what the influences antenatally are on um, the, uh, the oxytocin gene in particular and how that's associated with attachment. Um, and I'm going to get this wrong, but it's something broadly that I know there was, I'm not sure if it was her study or this was another one I was, was at, was there seemed to be this sort of correlation with um, quite high methylation of this gene in boys and also in avoidantly ta attached girls. And if you look at avoidant attachment, avoidant attachment is learning to squash your emotions down by the age of 12 months. So these are the little kids that sit there looking like they're chilled when mum is um, 
uh, not in the room, but in fact, if you measure their stress levels, etc., you find that they are actually as stressed and they've already learned to squash it down. So. In, in many ways, we'd say that's kind of what we're, we encourage or have historically encouraged boys to be, is to suck it up. Um, and one wonders if, if this gene is in some way involved in that. Um, this is still important and be, until our biological researchers give us the magic pill or tell us to do something differently. We still have these in our rooms and these are the ones that we need to treat and treating mother's depression alone won't necessarily treat their infant and the, the infant relationship difficulties. And we know um, depression and anxiety get in the way, um, that there are the, some of the symptoms, um, you're not mirroring your baby, you're not enjoying and delighting in your baby and reflecting that delight which tells your baby that they are hot you know, hot, best person in the world because my mum thinks I am. Um, and that's really important for babies to have in that first year of life. And if mum can't do it, then another carer um, can step in to do that. Um, but we need to pay attention to it. Um, and attachment's hugely important. Um, and if I'm doing hot, hot topics in perinatal psychiatry, some of you probably caught my 30 seconds on ABC, um, looking at the Kelly Lane case. Um, when you had about 10 hours of filming and you get down to 30 seconds, um, you can just go, yes, thank God, um, because one of the lawyers on it um, had to resign from his position after something that they, he said got put on air. So at least they didn't do that to me. Um, but what they did allow me to do was put an article up online which actually said what I needed to say. And I think I'm much better written than um, you know, random questions being thrown at you. And in Kelly Lane's case, attachment was a critical issue in who she was. Um, and if you haven't seen the series, it's on ABC iView. And just look at the parents and how the parents, I never interviewed the parents, um, but how they were is the mother um, at one stage gets upset and the father says to her, so this is Kelly's mother and father, Kelly's father says, um, oh, you need to go and get some tissues. And the tissues happened to be right there so she didn't have to go anywhere. And the father couldn't stomach her, him, her, his wife being upset and just stopped the interview. Um, and that happened Kelly's entire life. Um, the inability to sit with negative emotions. So, so this is important. Um, it's not, and, and I'm not saying we, there isn't a biological underpinning, but this is stuff we can make a difference with. So just because I like to do videos and make it real that there are real people involved in this, um, this is kind of one of my favourite videos of this is, was a very depressed, anxious woman who is actually ni neither depressed or anxious at this particular time. She's talking to her child. She's interested in a child. There's no eye contact in, in where they're sitting, but she's down at his level. There's all sorts of nice things happening here. Um, and she was very keen to be a good mum. And that's really in your favour until the child's sort of about one year old that um, they had, most women are desperate to be good mums and even some of the protective services cases that I'm involved with are willing to come and see you and do something about that. So you have this window of opportunity to make this huge change. But even in, in um, couples in front of you, middle class, looking like they're, they're doing well um, doesn't mean that they don't have attachment problems. And here you see that this baby is about to go splat. And probably just as well you can't hear it, but he's crying. Um, he's pretty unhappy. Um, and from an attachment point of view, he needs to be picked up and soothed. So she picks him up, but she faces him out. She doesn't cuddle him to her. Her voice is soothing, but there is no soothing going on here. Um, he is still crying, he's whimpering. Um, she's talking to him and there is eye contact, which is a vast improvement, um, but she's still encouraging him to play and um, show he's happy, get on with things, um, be a tough little boy. Um, he's still whimpering at this point in time and he's about to, to drop this on top of him and so that sets him off again. She's quite a distance from him. The only sort of the positive thing, she does touch him here and she, as I said, she is talking to him and has eye contact. He starts off crying again here. But I think what's the, the most beautiful thing about this is what the baby does next, which is reaches out 
He's your best co-therapist. He starts to soothe now when he has contact. Um, he's usually say, for God's sake, mum, pick me up. Um, but she's allowing this. Um, he finally does soothe. He gets what he needs. Um, and he's been able to do it for himself. That's not always going to work. Now, this mum wasn't setting out to be a super tough mum, but she's a primary school teacher and she wanted him to be one of those little boys aged five and a half going off to school says, bye mum, I'm, you know, I'm cool. And doing what she was doing would produce it the exact opposite. He was either going to be holding onto her leg for grim death because he was terrified, or if he did wave and, and said, I'm, I'm off, he was going to be so um, upset and anxious inside, he was going to end up as a, an ADHD or bullying or some um, difficulty. So even though you know this is not the worst relationship thing I've ever seen, it's still important to fix some of these um, things that are going on in the relationship. Mm -hmm.